Okay, we will be beginning right now. Just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon on this continuing series of Master Gardener Talks. My name is Aurelia Maraca. I'm the technology coordinator here at the Danbury Public Library. And on behalf of the friends of the Danbury Library, I welcome you to this program, Getting Started on the Pollinator Pathway. Um, you know, pollination enables the plants in our yards and parks and farms and orchards to reproduce. But sadly, a, a, you know, pollinator, pollinator populations are in sharp decline because of pesticide use and also loss of habitat. habitat. So that's why we are uh, you know, uh, trying to get Danbury on the pollinator pathway project. And that's uh, working to change all of this by establishing pollinator friendly habitats and food sources for bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinating insects and wildlife. So, and I would just like to introduce um, um, Mary Hogue. She's a member of the Pollinator Pathway Steering Committee and a 2014 graduate of the Yukon Master Gardener Compost Program. And, uh, and she's gonna be talking to, uh, to us a little bit about how Danbury can be, uh, you know, get, Danbury residents can help uh, getting Danbury on the pollinator pathway and also uh, some uh, tips on, uh, you know, increasing habitat for pollinators and a lot more. So enough of me talking, Mary, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I give this talk to you. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. I'm going to share my screen now, <laughs> not, not chat with my husband. <laughs> Um, let me close up everybody here. Close. And we'll go into, I never know where to put you here. Into slideshow, slideshow mode. Okay, so let's be the change, haha. -ha. Let's join the pollinator pathway. And um, Aurelia and I were talking and actually um, what I should say is that Danbury shouldn't join the pollinator pathway. We should continue being on the pollinator pathway. And as um, we go through the slides, you'll see that um, there are um, demonstration gardens. And as I've talked to many of you that are on the call and many that aren't on the call, um, there are plenty of pollinator gardens in Danbury already. And as um, Aurelio mentioned, I'm on the steering committee for the Pollinator Pathway Northeast. And um, I'll explain more what that means. But what is the pollinator pathway? So as um, these larger green areas show, this is maybe Terrywile, and maybe this is the Danbury Museum and some other larger open green spaces. And these are home uh, private spaces. And so what happens is we're connecting these larger um, green spaces with our home gardens. And these pollinators can move between these um, larger spaces and we're giving them the ability to get from the larger spaces by giving them little hopping grounds by having our pollinator gardens at our homes. So how could we do this as an example as our home garden? This could be your home garden versus the typical home garden which is mostly lawn with maybe a few foundation plantings. But this home has taken most of their lawn and they planted native plants. And in their backyard, they've surrounded their perimeter with trees and, and it's connected to perhaps maybe an old tree farm and maybe some open space. And you can see how the trees and the, the native plants here would allow for, excuse me, the pollinators and the birds and the wildlife to really have a wonderful home to come and rest and, and nourish themselves. So this is what we're talking about. So this ability to move oh, in and through. If you're not gonna be talking, could you mute? Thank you. Um, so why should we do this? So this is our one negative slide. So we'll breeze through this pretty quickly because we don't wanna be a downer. But um, we do know in general that the monarchs and the pollinators, pollinators in general are, are down. Um, so we won't spend too long. You can read this detail um, if you want, but um, 
it's it's not very positive news. Um, we are working our best to turn this around. Um, I don't have any positive trends to tell you at this point, but um, we're working on that. What is interesting to note is that there are a lot of diversity. There are almost uh, 350 types of bees in Connecticut. Most native bees are not bees that will sting you. Um, they don't have um, communal hives. They don't make honey. They don't have um, one queen with a lot of workers. So they're not interested in protecting and um, scaring you away, which is what a honeybee will be interested in doing. Um, hun uh, yellow jackets are uh, wasps. So um, I'm just gonna admit you, they aren't interested in, um, they are interested in, in scaring you away, especially in the fall when they're, um, they're winding down their life cycle. So they're desperate to just be angry. <laughs> so those aren't bees, those are wasps. Um, wasps are actually, bees are actually um, the, how can I describe this? Wasps came first. Bees um, forgot how to be angry, nasty wasps, if you want to think of it that way. 70% um, of the native bees are ground dwelling bees. Um, they make their nests in the ground. So if you want to help native bees, you want to keep bare spots in your ground, um, meaning don't mulch uh, every little inch. You want to leave some open uh, soil. And um, the other 30% are burrowing into trees or wood. You know about those, those wood boring bees um, or they'll uh, burrow into the stems of things that you, if you leave them, uh, your stems up above ground for the spring. So, and I don't know if you read this down here, honeybees are not native to the U North America. They are native to Europe. So they are non-native bees. So what are the threats to pollinators? There's loss of um, and fragmentation of habitat. So not all of Danbury looks this close together, but it could look like this. This is not anybody's habitat. This is, this is a barren wasteland. Um, pesticides and lawn chemicals. If you've got to get yourself all geared up to be covered in um, a face mask and gloves and so forth, if you've got to look like this, it's definitely not going to be good for your pollinators. Invasive plants and landscapes that lack natives and loss of plant diversity are certainly not going to be good for your pollinators. Climate change and light pollution. A lot of these pollinators travel very far um, if you put your lights on at night, you're causing a real distraction and confusion for the pollinators. So if you can put your lights on, if you need to put your lights on at night, which um, actually the, the data shows that it's actually making it easier for people to break in. Um, but if you feel more comfortable with your lights on, if you put them on a motion sensor or, and or uh, put a yellow light in, that would really help a lot. So the story of our pollinator pathway is that it's really only um, five years old. It started in 2016. There was a native dogwood planting and connecting the Housatonic River to the Hudson River. Um, so we were connecting Ridgefield, Connecticut to North Salem. And as well, the Connecticut Pollinator Protection Law was passed. In just five short years, we're now in New, um, sorry, in the U.S. and Canada, and we're in nine states, and we're in a 250 towns. So uh, we actually are not even incorporated or uh, don't even exist legally as an entity. We're working on creating a 501c3. So uh, we're actually just sort of a thought process. Uh, we're working on becoming a real life entity. So it's kind of exciting. It started out uh, by one of the people on the planning committee reading about uh, someone in Oslo, Sweden, who was reading about those terrible uh, statistics about all the pollinators decline and said, okay, everybody, let's get some containers, put them out on our balconies and on our doorsteps, and let's see if we can help our pollinator friends. And so they didn't live in, in the um, they lived in apartments, they didn't have yards, and it did the trick and they became a pollinator pathway 
uh, in an urban environment. So if they can do it in an urban environment, we can, you know, with with uh, no yards, we can certainly do it in a place where we have lots of open space and yards. So you can do it in containers. You can do it in down on Main Street. I'm working, I, I live in Fairfield. I'm working with commercial property owners to do demonstration gardens in, um, on, in uh, commercial properties. I was just at the ReStore in um, Danbury for Habitat for Humanity. And one of the people after the presentation, when I mentioned that, is going to work with her, um, her boss who owns the um, commercial property where she works and see if they can do something there. So if you work in the same environment, maybe you could do something in where your company works. You can do pollinator gardens um, in a bigger space. You can do, do demonstration spaces, and we'll see some of those that are happening in Danbury. You can do larger spaces at land trusts or in the municipalities. Um, a lot of schools like to do um, outdoor labs or um, sort of uh, quiet calming spaces. So a lot of towns are doing schools, uh, pollinator gardens at all their schools. So the message is really simple. Um, there are four main areas that we like to encourage people to, to do. We like want them to th rethink their lawn. This uh, I borrowed from the Fairfield Pledge. Um, and I should point out that of all those 250 towns, every town does it differently. <clears throat> so there is no one right or wrong way to implement the pollinator pathway. So the way Danbury is going to do it is going to be the right way for Danbury. So um, this is right off of um, the, the Fairfield Pledge, every town not every town has a pledge, but most do. Um, so uh, we ask you to rethink your lawn and uh, it, try and take at least a little bit of your lawn and turn it into something that has native pollinator garden, uh, pollinator plants. Try to do less pesticides. Little by little, you do less and less until eventually we hope you'll do no pesticides. Um, garden like mother nature clean up in the spring, don't clean up in the fall. A lot of uh, people talk about putting their gardens to bed in the fall, but really what the, was best is if you can leave your garden as is in the fall, all those seed heads are wonderful food for the birds and other critters. It's also, as I said, those stalks from the perennials is a great place for um, many of our native bees to lay their eggs. And then when you have, <clears throat> excuse me, three um, days of about 60, 58 to 60 degree temperature, that's when the baby uh, bees emerge from those stalks. And then it would be safe to take those stalks down. I have a lot of deer in my area. So leaving those stalks up for the um, new plants to come up is a great deer deterrent. So that's my um, native uh, deer deterrent. Um, Leave the leaves. A lot of people feel that, you know, you can't leave the leaves out because they look so awful, but that's a natural mulch that you're just throwing away. Um, same with when you mow your lawn, you should keep your uh, grass clippings on your lawn. That's nitrogen that you're just throwing away instead of going out and buying nitrogen. Just keep the grass clippings up there and uh, let your grass um, be up to three inches tall when you mow it. Don't, don't, mow it too low because otherwise you're just taking away the the uh, shade that will keep down the uh, non uh, lawn that grass that you or the weeds that you don't want and as well as keeping the moisture in and if you have a water feature you'll definitely be helping your pollinators as well as bringing in all sorts of other fun critters that are fun to watch um, one of my neighbors talks about it's so much more fun to just go out and look in the yard and than to watch, turn on the uh, TV. So um, those are our four simple messages. And it may surprise you that the America's biggest crop is not what you think, it's lawn. There are over 40 million acres of lawn in some form in the US, which is kind of amazing when you think about a lawn, if you think of it as a crop. And why is turf grass not so easy to grow? Well, if you look at the level or depth of roots, you can see how deep these go. 
and these will be able to survive pretty much the amount of rain that falls from the sky. But you can barely see any root structure for this turf grass. And that's why we have to have our fancy irrigation systems and have to really coddle our turf grass. So not only do they provide little to no habitat, they really can't help get any nutrients. So they need the fertilizers and they, they were, are um, susceptible to all sorts of pests, but their root systems are too shallow to be able to get any water other than what's at the, uh, what is available immediately. And they can't keep the water around. So the water all just runs off whenever there's uh, storms, especially the severe storms events that we have more and more often due to climate change. So having these more native plants with these deeper root structures means that we are able to keep the water with these severe storm events uh, locally in our land. Oops, go back. So uh, that's why native plants are so important from a uh, water issue. Lawns use tons and tons of water. In lower Fairfield County, where I am, 40% of the water is used outdoors, jumping to 70% in the summer. And nationally, lawns suck up to 9 billion gallons of water per day, according to the EPA. So really um, a problem. Here in Danbury, you have the Still River Watershed and you have a watershed management plan. Um, and um, it includes, uh, the Still River Watershed includes eight communities, including Danbury. And um, it's not in the best of health that it could be. One of the ways that you can improve the health of the watershed is by natural management of the land. Naturally managing your land means that you're not um, expressing those uh, pesticides and herbicides into the water and therefore you will improve the water quality. So by improving the way we manage our land, we can improve the water quality. So this helps tremendously your still river watershed. So this is an awful silly picture. Who dresses like this? But the reason that we manage our lawn is because of thoughts that were created when people dress like this. Lawns were came into fashion during the 1700s when people who dressed like this said, um, if, uh, as a status symbol, you had lawn because you could afford to have a lawn because you had the servants that were able to cut the lawn for you. So um, if we're still thinking in this manner, then we're thinking from very, very old times. So maybe we should start updating our thinking. Like this lawn, this lawn is from the Vatican. It's all clover, not a stitch of lawn in it. It's actually a clover meadow, so to speak. So if it's good enough for the Pope, maybe it's good enough for us. In Minnesota, they're actually paying residents to grow pollinator lawns. So there are different ways to consider what your front yard can look like. So you don't need to go all boxwood. You can go with all sorts of shrubs that will bring all sorts of pollinators to your garden that will make it much more fun to be in your yard and much more interesting. You don't have to let your entire yard go natural. Wildflowers can come naturally, you can plant them. It can be wild, it can be uh, very uh, precise. You don't have to do anything any particular way. Any way you do it that you like is the right way to do it. It's really the point. But any master gardener will tell you that you should test your soil first to see if you need to put any gardening, uh, any uh, amendments in, but try and be sure you do it the organic way. Again, leave your leaves. If you can go electric, um, there's, a, there's an organization called um, Quiet Communities. If anyone's interested in that um, in Fairfield, we're, we're trying to start up a group called Quiet uh, Fairfield. There's a group that's very interested in trying to um, 
get an ordinance to um, limit the amount of time that people can run their uh, gas powered machinery. I'm not sure how far along they are, but there, there are people um, that are doing that um, in New York. I don't know how far they're getting going in Connecticut, but um, uh, we're in May and there's no mo May. If you go on our website, which is www.pollinator-pathway.org, we have blog posts that come out very frequently. We have a newsletter that comes out um, every other month. Um, and there is information about no mo May. Uh, Plant Life's No Mo May campaign showed that um, there's enough nectar that uh, if you don't mow, this is a clover garden, this is, uh, this is from the Plant Life's No Mow campaign, that, that will support pollinators just by not mowing. Uh, the person who wrote our article is not mowing except for a pathway through her garden or through her, her lawn. Sorry, she's, she's uh, still mowing, but she's creating pathways. So everybody gets to do it the way they feel most comfortable. This is another garden. This is a transformation of um, Cape Elizabeth Children's Garden in Portland, Maine. This was what it was, which was pretty much a barren lawn no pollinators were visiting here. And now what a pollinator garden can look like. Very, very, very big transformation. Another transformation, this is a stamp house in Stanford. This is uh, my friend Melanie's house. And uh, she just picked up some patches of lawn that she wanted to remove and put in native plants. And now she has a lovely perimeter of pollinator native plants. And it's that simple. And she still has a lawn. So not hard to do. So avoid pesticides. And you definitely don't want to plant the cat mint to bring in the bees and then apply pesticides. Because then you're just creating an ecological trap. You're bringing in the, the pollinators and you're having them come in where there's poisons. So you don't want to do both. You want to, you want to make sure that if you're going to put in the natives that you stop applying the pesticides. So that's an important one. And instead of pesticides and chemical fertilizers, you can go the native route. First, spray yourself instead of the yard. If you're worried about ticks, you can landscape naturally. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Barberry is a, a vector for uh, the ticks because that's where the, the uh, deer mice who are the, the host of the ticks generally like to live. It's most likely where the ticks will be. So if you have Barberry on your property, you should remove it. It's an invasive. So that's another reason to get rid of it. And it will spread mightily, uh, very quickly. You can get tick boxes um, and you can plant native plants and they will attract native uh, and beneficial insects. The plants that were most likely will do that will be plants that have flat tops like Queen Anne's lace or yarrow. And if you do go organic, you do wanna be careful because even organic um, quote unquote pesticides can be uh, detrimental to our pollinators. So uh, just to, on this slide, these are aphids on the bottom here, and this is a ladybug or lady beetle. The uh, larval state of a ladybug is actually really the, the one that is notorious for getting aphids, but uh, ladybugs are great for aphids and you can purchase those through uh, online catalogs. So beneficial insects are hidden everywhere. This is actually the larval version of a lady beetle, if you can believe it. It looks like a little alligator, I think. Um, there's a trash bug. He rolls around and he rolls the trash around himself. And here is the beautiful but deadly lacewing. Um, isn't, isn't she beautiful? He, I don't know if you can tell the difference, um, but that's a beautiful name for it. It's a beautiful lacewing, it's very effective. So we're trying to get rid of seeing these yellow signs <clears throat> and trying to see more of our pollinator pathway signs. And um, I am looking for 
um, locations in Danbury that are interested in selling these pollinator pathway signs. So if you're interested in uh, being a, a location in Danbury to sell these signs, I'd be interested in hearing from you. So native plants, if you plant it, they will come. Um, that is for sure. So this is some a monarch and a bumblebee on some but, uh, butterfly weed, a, a hummingbird, this is a honey a native honeysuckle. The yellow and white is the non-native and there's some echinacea. So why native plants? So um, this is a story we like to tell. This is the um, story of the two dogwoods. So the native dogwood is the Cornus Florida. And this time of year, the uh, blue azure butterfly is, is around and comes to visit the native, butterf um, native uh, dogwood, which comes in pink and white. Um, and then in the fall, it has these lovely red berries that the birds love to eat. And in Fairfield, we have our lovely dogwood festival. So this is the um, caterpillar of the blue azure, which sort of seems to mimic the, the twig of the native um, dogwood. And then we have the Kusa dogwood, which is from Japan. And these are the berries, which are much bigger than the um, native dogwood. And it's a beautiful, prolific flowering dogwood. And um, there's nothing to say that, you know, we can't appreciate the beauty of it, but it's only feeding this monkey, which, oops, as far as I know, was only found in Japan, not in Connecticut. So um, I don't think you'll ever see any leaves eaten. And um, I believe you can make jam out of the, the berries, but I have no idea. I've never tried. So one thing we like to say is that trees are meadows of the sky. Um, trees are a very big part of the pollinator pathway. People don't often think of trees and when they think of uh, pollinators, um, but uh, we, these are mostly, uh, you know, oaks are, are probably the, the best, most productive tree you could plant. I don't see it on this list, uh, oaks. Um, in our neck of the woods will support 534 caterpillar species, mostly moths. Um, so uh, even though it's wind pollinated, um, it is great for the, for the caterpillars. And I'm just gonna move this to show you that uh, these are great handouts on our, uh, th our website that you can print out. You can see what you want is you want um, a season, three season uh, blooms. So spring through fall, um, I wish it really went February through um, even November, um, but uh, you can see that these are great lists and there's plenty of lists on our website. So this is trees, these are sh er, shrubs, these are early shrubs because the queens come out really early and um, really great list of, these are also early trees too as well, low growing trees. And um, the other thing to note is there are lots and lots of specialist pollinators. Um, so this is a uh, Lily Pulitzer uh, moth. This is our evening primrose. And this moth only pollinates this, um, this flower. And when it crawls in, the only part that sticks out is this little white part. And it, um, uh, my friend Louise has this in her yard and she thought it was looking a little leggy and she was gonna cut it down and she was shaking it out and the moth came out and she decided that she wasn't gonna cut it out anymore. So um, everybody has a reason for being and she's now never gonna cut her evening primrose out. So, uh, the theory is that, oops, gosh, I keep doing that. We should work towards having 70, 80% of our plantings be native so that the ratio increases the native insect population because this moth can only work with this plant. But then the generalist pollinators will go to, will go to this plant as well as any other plant. So um, there's a really amazing evolutionary uh, over the millennia the correlation between the plant 
and the pollinator. So some, as I say, are specific pollinator to plant and some will just, will go to any plant to uh, get their nectar and pollen. Another thing that people ask about, and um, the jury is still out and they're still studying is, um, is it important to be an absolute strict native or can you go with a cultivar or, or sometimes people call them nativars. Um, so they're still doing research. And so these poor women have to sit on these upside down um, containers and count pollinators on the plants. And they're trying to understand what is the correlation. Um, and as far as I've been hearing, um, it hasn't been definitively decided, but um, <clears throat> they are doing research to try and find out. They're finding that double blooms are not, um, they're hard for the pollinators to get in. So double blooms are not considered to be good for pollinators. Um, what else have they decided? Um, best likely is that if you can go with a straight native, that's uh, what they're thinking makes the most sense because those have been over the millennia, what has gone through millions of years of evolution together. Um, we talked about leaving the leaves. I thought the next slide was my ecotype one. I'll, I'll get back to that whole native. I should have put it in a different order, sorry. Um, but just to talk about leaving the leaves and the so forth. Um, um, we talked about uh, leaving the leaves, their, their food, their shelter, many uh, pollinators overwinter in the leaves, sometimes as larvae, sometimes as adults. Um, so uh, I talked about how the, the uh, bees lay their eggs in the reeds. So hydrangea, which aren't native, but they can be used for um, laying eggs. Snags and old wood are good for uh, the minor bees. Um, they're also good for um, all sorts of microinvertebrate and birds. The ground dwelling bees need the dirt patches. So we've covered that many times. So how do we start a pollinator pathway in your town? These are milkweed seeds, by the way. So it's pretty exciting that it's starting to come up. So you may recognize your logo on this. Some of you I know are on here. Um, I've talked to everybody from these organizations and I know you're all really excited to be part of the pollinator pathway. And um, it's pretty exciting to see how many groups in Danbury are already participating. I think um, there's probably other organizations that I'm not aware of that I haven't met and uh, connected with. So if there are others, please, you know, connect with each other, connect. Um, usually this kind of a meeting is done in person. So you guys can all connect and meet each other. I don't know if you all know each other, um, but exciting, oops, that isn't working. Why isn't it working? Exciting news, Danbury already has pollinator gardens in public spaces and probably has loads of pollinator gardens in private spaces as well. So the Danbury Museum and Garden Club, well, actually it started in the spring and was installed in the summer. I jumped the gun when I wrote this, um, but isn't this beautiful? This is really lovely. So, and especially that it was done in 2020. I was so impressed that it happened this year. That's kind of amazing. So um, let's just see what happens this year. But this is lovely. So this is uh, yarrow. This is one of those plants I was saying was great for attracting beneficial insects. And this is Terry Weil. And um, this is, was installed in the fall. And then we just got there this spring and we were weeding. And these have been plants just coming up again. 
And this is part of the ecotype project. Oh, I still didn't get to my ecotype. Okay, I'll have to wait for my ecotype project discussion. Um, so here's my friend Louise. Here's Elizabeth Craig. Uh, they're on the um, steering committee with me. And so they're planning out in some towns, they created um, a route in Fairfield. We just said pollinators don't know what a route is. They just fly wherever they can fly. So it's up to Pan Danbury if they want to say this is the route for the pollinator pathway or everywhere you go, there's a pollinator pathway. Um, here's the ecotype project um, garden in Terry. Well, oh, got in here twice. Sorry about that. Um, we'll talk. Oh, no, it didn't. Sorry. I'm, everyone is encouraged to be on the pollinator pathway. Okay. Most important is you want to promote the pollinator pathway. So we have a generic pollinator pathway brochure. Um, originally we started out with every town having their own, but it got to be so expensive that, um, it's just a lot more uh, cost effective to get a major run of a generic pollinator pathway, um, brochure. So if Danbury's interested, we are doing, um, another run of that. We have a generic logo and we now have two signs. We have a six inch sign and we have a 12 inch sign. We generally sell the six inch sign to the general public for $5 and the 12 inch sign for $20. The cost of them when we buy them in bulk is cheaper. So um, when organizations sell them, they can sell them as fundraisers. So again, if anyone's interested in selling these at their location, please let me know. And we have tons and tons of um, double-sided one-pagers to hand out. Um, you can um, download, people can self-serve, download, or you can print them out and have them at your location. And that's at pollinator-pathway.org. Um, again, signs can be used to raise funds. And this is a sample of a pledge. They're usually a half page, so you put two to a page. You want a sequence of blooms from spring to fall. And we try to make it so it's not um, absolutist. You're trying to get people to move from where they are to the next level. So you're trying not to scare people away. So you're trying not to say you must or you can only be on the pollinator pathway if you do X. Um, so, uh, we say things like endeavor to, or, um, try to, or, um, especially do things like that, avoid, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so however you, um, word your pledge, it's, those are the kinds of wordings we suggest. And we encourage you to do, uh, a major kickoff event and have fun. Um, here's our friend Topeka. She does a lot of work on our website. She's done an amazing job where she's given um, towns the ability to create their own web page, filling out sort of a self-service form. And um, you can create the most beautiful website for Danbury and you can upload some pictures of, you know, the museum uh, garden, the Terry Wild garden, some other gardens, and you have an amazing website all within, you know, however long it takes for you to fill, it, fill out the form. It's really beautiful. Um, so you want to identify your potential public pollinator pathway spaces. You want it to be as prominent as possible so people can see it. You want to be putting signs out, making them as visual as possible. Again, three seasons. That's general practice to have three plants when you're planting things um, early as much as possible. The native queens, when they come out, they're, they're so hungry. So you really wanna be as early as possible. The trees in this order, descending order, is the, are the um, top larval hosts. In Ridgefield, this is the second year that they've had these containers at, in their main street. And um, they have uh, the, the signs 
and they have these um, containers that have three seasons of natives and then they had a cedar to have something throughout the um, winter and they're having their native plants come back. So they did have to make sure that they kept them watered and cared for, but they're finding that, you know, as long as they took care of them, they're saving money with um, their plantings because they're not having to pay for annuals every year. So that really, uh, my uh, commercial uh, property owner was very excited to hear that. So he may take a visit with me to Ridgefield to see how these work out. So there's lots of ways that you can encourage the community members, uh, you know, business people, town stakeholders and staff, you know, have a plant sale, do a community planting effort, get corporate donation and volunteers, get your scouts and building your Danbury human community is going to build your Danbury pollinator community. So it's building community on all levels. Oh, here's my mouse. There we go. Um, you're not, Danbury is not currently on the sustainable CT uh, program. That's a program where the uh, municipality can uh, gain points to show how sustainable, sustainable it is. Um, but I was told by the um, city staff that they are looking into it. They have to pass a resolution to join it. If they do become part of it, uh, if they do all the things that are easily done to be on the pollinator pathway, they can move and get 20% of the points needed to be a sustainable CT town. One of them is to, to pass a pollinator pathway resolution, sort of like a town proclamation. So this is what um, Newtown did. Um, and we have those town resolutions on our pollinator pathway website, which is pollinator-pathway.org. Spreading the word, all sorts of ways of doing that. Stay connected. You can sign up for the blog posts on the pollinatorpathway.org website. Um, there are grants. Here's two different ways that you can do it. And in June, the iNaturalist Bio Blitz is a lot of fun. And you just have to download the iNaturalist uh, app and there's gonna be lots of information on our website. And here's my, <laughs> my slide about the Ecotype Project. Very exciting, we're working with CT NOFA, which is the Northeast Organic Farming Association. And they're working with scientists to collect native wild seed and growing it at uh, founders plots. And um, these are actually seeds that are known to be native to our region and will be sold in nurseries. And they're creating the first ever local of ecotype plants and seeds in our area. So it's really pretty cool. And that's what's growing in the Terry Wild plot. And grad students from WCSU are monitoring that. And that's a science experiment that is happening in your town. So here's Doug Tallamy, this is my last slide. Um, he is considered sort of our father of the pollinator pathway. He wrote this book, I believe in 2014, oh no, sorry, this book in 2014, you might've heard of it, Bringing Nature Home. Jess wrote this book, uh, I think last year. And Jess wrote this book this year. Oops, sorry, sorry, not clicking. Nature Oaks, because as he, uh, he's an entomologist out of Delaware talking about how oaks are, you know, the most productive tree that you can have, not just for pollinators, but for nature in general. And he follows his oak in his yard month by month. So it's a really fun read about how oaks and um, his four acre plot in Delaware, uh, you know, how it transforms throughout the 12 month cycle. So that's my presentation. I wanted to leave time for, for questions. And if you had any questions that you can't think of now, you can write to info at pollinatorpathway.org. And again, the um, website is pollinator dash, don't forget the dash, that's important, dash pathway.org. And here we are. Thank you, Mary. 
Uh, I do have, uh, I leave this open to everyone. If they want to ask some questions, please just type it in the chat. We've had already a couple of questions through during your presentation, Mary. I'm just going to read them to you. Um, the temperature that the bees need to uh, hatch eggs. What's the temperature? I believe it's 58 to 60 degrees. And is it okay right. to use a deer stopper, uh, you know, like spray to keep the deer from lunching on our plants? Uh, yeah, because usually that stuff is, you know, you know, natural sort of things. It's nothing. It's like Bob, Bob X and all that stuff is, is like coyote urine and things like that. It's nothing nasty. And also for uh, nighttime, is it okay to use uh, citronella candles? Um, I haven't ever looked into that. I guess so. I don't you know, know. In terms of like light pollution and, um, you know. Oh, light pollution. I don't. I don't know, certainly in terms of light pollution, that, that's more for uh, bugs, but yeah. Yeah. So um, does anyone have any questions before we move on <laughs> towards the end? My question it's would pretty, be- pretty quiet. <laughs> my question would be, cause see, normally we'd have like a sign in sheet and everybody would share each other's contact information. I just don't understand how we would be able to do that sharing of contacts. Uh, how would, how is that possible? I would say if anyone who is interested to contact you uh, directly, if they want to pursue, uh, you know, uh, maybe being part of a, uh, a group, you know, there could be, is, uh, is there some sort of like a Facebook group that could be started by one, like yourself or one of the no, not me <laughs> <laughs> no this is dan this is the danbury group so i yeah. i would step out of the ring i'm not danbury so it would be you know um how danbury wants to work with the danbury it's you know yeah i'm that just trying something to that um, i would so that suggest someone you know if you want to like what you heard this evening and you want to pursue this further, this would be something where you would ask, like, you know, like folks, like, hey, maybe we can, you know, I'm going to start a Facebook group. You can join up here. You know, you can actually, um, you know, uh, email me and I can, you know, maybe even, uh, um, you know, direct people to the, uh, the group uh, who are in this uh, uh, presentation or, um, oh, yeah. We so can, like, uh, one, one suggestion is like write the name and address in the chat area of the, uh, what was that for, Linda? Like oh, that's you know, slide. The, uh, yeah, go ahead. I like the slide that I had of all the organizations, like having all the people who lead those organizations, I guess it would be helpful if all those organization leads would be interested in connecting with each other, at least starting there. Yeah, I think that that would be um, something that I would say, like, if you forward that to me, I could forward that to everyone who has registered uh, for this presentation. And uh, let's see, oh, to have the name and address of everyone in the chat area to, uh, to have a contact with each other, that would be something that I really can't do on behalf of the library to post everyone's, <laughs> uh, you know, name, and address and everything, because I just get, uh, you know, just a name and just an email address and everything. So um, yes, Luann has said, maybe we should connect with the Danbury Garden Club. Great idea, great suggestion. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, they're not on here, I don't think. But the person I talked to isn't on here. Oh, no, yes, she is. I think that's who Diane is. But um, I... Yeah, so that's the problem is this normally this is something that um, there there isn't one group taking the lead. So that's normally the case. So in Fairfield, um, the forestry committee took the lead on it. Normally there is one group that does take the lead. I don't know if, if Danbury has somebody that wants to take the lead. It's not, um, I haven't seen that happen yet in Danbury. That remains to be seen. So that is something that we're waiting 
for you know so, some uh, group to actually uh, you know lead uh, the effort to adding more pollinator gardens in our area. And sometimes it's it's um, a coordinated effort. It doesn't have to be one group. I think sometimes it's a a, a collaboration with groups. Yes. In yes. Darien, believe it or not, um, the realtors took a lead role. Really? Wow, the realtors. <laughs> yeah. And they funded um, the pamphlets. And every time somebody comes to the realtor, that's in uh, the packet that they give to the prospective home buyers. So there, that's just who the, the cause Dabika and her friend Juliet are on the steering committee and they just are totally sold to, you know, that's, that just happens to be the people that are, they're two realtors in the, in the mix. So it depends, um, depends on who you get that are interested in the town. Well, now that this is great that we have this, uh, you know, everyone who is here today and also this will be on YouTube and also on public access. So spread the word, uh, connect, uh, contact, you know, some local organizations and, you know, try to get more people involved. So the more people involved, the more uh, of a chance that we get of adding a lot more uh, spaces to the pollinator pathway here in Danbury. We have another question. I'm just going to read this to this. It seems that if we're on this call, we're open to sharing our names and contact info with each other. Uh, you can ask the group now to indicate, are you willing to be contacted by having them put a yes or no in the chat box? Um, I would say, yeah, it is, but I would say it would probably be, um, you know, we get, it really can't, uh, you know, if, if, if someone, I, I would say this, I can share all the information that Mary has, uh, will be sending to me to everyone. And um, that would be something that um, I think you can connect at a later date, but I really can't share everyone's uh, names and, you know, contact information and everything through uh, this, this, this chat because uh, uh, we get into, you know, privacy and liability issues and everything. So, um, but that remains to be seen once we, we reopen and uh, we are uh, get a chance to meet in person and be able to share this, you know, once we're all together. And that's what, there was kind of something between me and Mary that, you know, bringing this uh, conversation uh, via virtual on Zoom was a little, uh, you know, uh, different from say, our uh, um, past presentations because this is more of a sort of, uh, you know, a chance to bring this to light and also to, you know, get people to get together, but it's a little hard to do that, you know, especially, you know, in, on, a, on a Zoom call, especially with, uh, uh, you know, people's privacy and everything. But uh, I thank you for, you know, stating that, uh, you know, uh, that question. And we also have someone else here uh, Linda, she is the honorary senior state president for the children of the American Revolution and a leader leading a number of planting of pollinator gardens around the state as a state project. Great. So it is a project that her grandson is a state president of. So I'm searching for any info she can get. So that will be something that will be coming in the next day <laughs> once uh, Mary gives me a, uh, a list and also links to everything. I will pass them on to everyone who has registered for this uh, presentation. Yeah. If, any, yeah, if anyone is interested in, in the deck also, uh, the PowerPoint deck, feel free. If you write to info at pollinator pathway, Dot org. Just mention my name because that's going to a general mailbox. So just be sure and mention my name so it'll get to me. And we will pass this on. And we'll also on public access, I will, you know, put a PDF of what Mary will uh, share with me. So hopefully they can put that as a slide picture <laughs> right about now. <laughs> So if there's any other questions uh, you, uh, you may have, uh, put them in the, the chat. If not, I will say uh, on behalf of the Danbury Library, I thank Mary 
for being with us this evening and sharing her uh, her thoughts and her uh, her, her her work and uh, you know what she's been doing. Uh, you know, being a, a master gardener. Tell us a little bit about that program, if anyone's interested in that, you know, uh, becoming a master gardener. Yeah, the master gardener program is wonderful. It's through the Yukon Extension program. It's it's a wonderful uh, bargain. You pay just a few hundred dollars. Um, you go in the fall. Let's see, I guess you go in the fall, you go through fall, winter, early spring, then you get let out and you're asked to go do some um, volunteer program and you never look at the world the same. You really get your eyes opened um, and it's a, a, a very dangerous <laughs> Uh, program because you're driving to your program and you're looking at the trees and the grass and everything because you're all your head is spinning with all this new information you go once a week for a day um, and it's it's a basic intro uh, to entomology and then it's a basic intro to turf basic intro to orchards and whatever and um, and then you do a written exam and a practical exam and uh and then you're asked to do volunteer hours and f answer the phone. So when you call the extension office, you're calling and talking to master gardeners. Um, and there is also a master composter program as well. So there are two different programs. Um, so those are both really wonderful and worth the very little bit of money that you pay to go take a class. So there you go, everyone. If you're interested, uh, please look into that program. Uh, but uh, it is getting to be five o'clock. It is the end of our hour. And I would like to say thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, until next time, my name is Aurelia Maraca. On behalf of the Amberley Library, I'd like to say good evening. <laughs>